Yeah, you should. Yeah, it does. Yeah, Let's... share a slideshow of um, South End zines to sort of set. So it's all this slideshow is set to the anarchic tones of um, South End's first punk band, the the Machines, and the the song is called um, "You Better You Better Hear." And so I'm just gonna kick that off. You better hear. You better hear. You better hear from me. You better hear. Time scream and call. Blast up from the floor. Blowing every gun. Power from the bun. You better hear. Let that way Destroy another day You better hear You better hear You better hear me You better hear It's a bomb but Well I'm in prison It's the same better Go to bed I'm in a crowd Well I'm a person Don't you hear Just, just what I said You better hear You better hear You better hear me Okay, you better, you better hear yeah. Woo, woo Okay, so I hope that sort of blew the, the cobwebs off a little bit. Um, so hello everyone and thanks for, for coming. Um, what, how we're going to structure today's talk, there'll be a, um, uh, I'll do a quick introduction to, to um, Graham and his sort of background. Um, this will be followed by a, a 20 minute-ish presentation on, on zines and then uh, a half an hour Q&A session which will kick off between myself and Graham and then will be opened up um, to, to you to you um, if you could pop um, either questions in the chat um, but I probably won't because of we thought people might be coming um, um, via their, their computers so um, if you could um, kind of if I guess if um, uh, Tony could sort of field those those questions in the classroom um, that would be that would be great sure so um, today's guest guest speaker is Graham Burnett who has kindly come along to talk about zines and his soon to be published book South End on Zine um, South End on, on Zine is the culmination of a three-year research project documenting the visual culture and creativity as well as um, the voices and stories from South End's underground and alternative press. In addition to making zines and researching zine culture, Graham teaches permaculture and publishes extensively on the subject. He turned um, vegetarian in 1977, shortly after leaving school and then became vegan in 1984. Made politically aware in part by the, the punk music scene of those times, he was um, involved in many campaigns such as Hunt Saboteurs, Ban the Bomb, Anti-Apartheid and uh, Opposing the Poll Tax. Graham founded the ethical venture Spiral Seed in 2001 
and has worked with organizations locally, nationally and internationally. And his publications include um, Forest Gardening, a beginner's guide, the Vegan Book of Permaculture, Permaculture and uh, a Beginner's Guide, Earth Writings um, and Well Fed, Not an Animal Dead, um, way back in 19, 1985. And is currently also writing the regenerative allotment and garden. He is also a regular contributor to newspapers and magazines such as the Sunday Times, Growing Green, and the Vegan. Additionally, his artwork features in a new exhibition called Tip of the Iceberg at the Focal Point Gallery, South End on Sea, exploring the relationship between art and alternative growing practices which are increasingly coming together in pursuit of climate action and social social just, justice. So um, please give a, a warm welcome to Graham Burnett. He'll start things off with his presentation. Um, thanks, Tim. Uh, can everyone hear that OK? Sounds yeah, great, all right. Good. Good. Great, that's good. I'm just going to do the old screen share thing. Bear with me a second. Okay, so hopefully people can see that. Um, okay, yeah, as Tim talked about there, for the last few years I've been working on this project here, South End on Zine, which is a documentation of um, 50 years of um, alternative publications from, from the town I live in, um, from 1971 to 2021. Um, Obviously, in a 20-minute presentation, that's an awful lot to try and fit in and cover. So I'm just going to focus on maybe my own story and a zine or fanzine that I produced. And this is based on an interview uh, with Professor Matt Worley, who's part of the, um, um, the Punk Academics uh, Network, who are also interested in this kind of thing. Anyway, without further ado, so, uh, my, bear with me, it's my, not moving along, there we go. So New Crimes was my fanzine, which ran from 1980 to 84, and that was started by myself, and that's me, back in 1980, sitting on the back of a lorry at South End Carnival with, um, as you can see, there was a punk band called The Cynics playing. Um, my friend Chris Kemp, a.k.a. In, in, the, in New Crimes, he went under the pen name of Voss Trent. And Stephen Dobson, who was also known as Dr. Pretorius. Although, after the second issue, it was basically just me. It was printed at home using a Gestetner duplicator, which is this rather cumbersome looking object that you can see on the screen here. Um, so it was a process that involved, involved typing or directly drawing onto special wax stencil sheets that then were attached to an ink, ink filled drum that you can't, can't see but it's inside there. And you would then load paper into the machine, turn the handle and print the pages one by one at a time in batches. This was an incredibly messy business with very high paper wasted rates. So what would happen the ink application on the first pages would come through the machine much too thick and would either smear or the ink would seep through the paper and then you'd get about 50 or, 50 or so good copies and then after that the ink would start to run low and be too light and uneven on the page so you'd have to refill the drum and start the whole process all over again and the machine would often jam up and need to be unblocked which would inevitably waste even more paper so kind of unusable pages be something as high as like about 40% in any print run. And also get, used to get ink all over my mum's living room carpet, so that didn't really make me very popular either. So it's very messy business. And then there was all the tedium of collating and stapling the pages together, which would involve organising loads of piles of paper all over the house, all over the dining room table and the kitchen, and putting each copy together by hand, which was... Uh, very labour intensive and I love it that nowadays I can just email a PDF file off to a printer and then they come back all nicely bound and collated in a nice cardboard box a few days later. Anyway we acquired 
the duplicator from a local arts and poetry group who produced a magazine called Bang. And they sold to me the duplicator for 20 quid when they upgraded and outsourced their own production to a local print shop. Um, so New Crimes sold for 25p a copy, which just about recuperated costs, I think. Although lots of copies will also be traded with other people who are making zines all around the country and also internationally. Zines were really kind of proliferating around this time. Just about everybody and their dog seems to be putting together their own zine around 1980 to 82. That felt like kind of really golden era for me, especially for um, kind of anarcho-punk zines, which is kind of what I was doing. Um, before this, I used to love being involved with the school magazine. I would write science fiction horror stories that would be included. And then after I left school, I became involved with um, Bang, who I just noted, um, mentioned, who were, as I say, an arts and poetry uh, kind of group. Um, I go along to the editorial meetings, I got some insight into that process. And I also used to submit gig reviews to another local punk magazine uh, or fanzine called Strange Stories that was produced just up the road in Basildon. So we're in about like 1978 to 79 now. Um, so around this time there were lots of these independent record shops like um, Projection Records which is pictured here, um, Record World, there were just like these little indie, indie record shops all over the place and quite often they would have like a little section where they sell music magazines like um, Zigzag or other independent things and often they'd stock a few fanzines and that's how I um, bought my very first punk fanzine which was um, Sniffing Glue. This was actually the very first issue I ever bought, the very first kind of punk zine I ever bought. Excuse me, and as you can see the date there around August, September 1977. Um, then a little later after that I'd go up to um, Rough Trade in um, Labrook Grove and um, Companion Books which was in Camden Town, independent bookshops and I'd just pick up bundles of fan, you know, buy fanzines um, you know, they were really really proliferating around them um, things like Toxic Graffiti, Jamming, uh, New Pose, Rapid Eye Movement and I'd fervently devour these and there you'd kind of learn about the bands that you that you liked, that you were listening to, that you're interested in. Um, bands like Crass, the Pop Group, the Slits, the Raincoats, Joy Division. Always from a, a different kind of on the ground perspective from what the um, what was being written by professional music journalists in Sounds and the Enemy, Melody Maker, and all these magazines have now long disappeared themselves. And I think at some point, I just thought, well, why don't we do our own zine? Then we can just put exactly what we like in it. So Chris, who I mentioned earlier, and myself, we worked in different part departments at the um, tax office in Port Cullis House in South End. And in our lunch breaks, we'd get together and chat about putting our zine together. And at the start, we were very much reacting against what was known as the Thames Delta scene in South East Essex which was actually kind of ironic as those bands like Dr Feelgood, Wilco Johnson and the pub rock broom, boom, broom, boom, were in turn, they were kind of a pre-punk reaction against sort of prog rock and overproduced music from California that was dominating the early 1970s music scene. And so they were trying to bring music very much back to basics at that time. But by the mid-70s, practically every pub in South End would be full of bands imitating that, playing generic, unimaginative, third world, a third rate, that R&B. I think R&B has a different meaning now to what it meant then. It, but back then it was kind of blues and punk rock and that and pub rock, that kind of thing. Things like Johnny Be Good, Get Your Kicks on Route 66 and that. And we found all that really boring. So we actually had this um, 
no R&B policy, which we did relax once or twice when we got an in a chance to interview Alison Moye, who was at the time in a local blues band called the Scream Yad Dabs. But generally, we'd feature younger, lesser known local punk bands who were like our peers. Um, the Cynics, like I say, who were playing on the back of that truck in that earlier photo. The Shocks, the School Bullies, the Icons, the Nihilist Core, and groups that were doing more experimental, kind of post-punk stuff. Um, yeah, sort of um, bands like, there were bands with names like 86 Mix, the Ele Electronic Students, the Solicitors, and there was an unknown band from Basildon called Depeche Mode, whose first ever gig was reviewed in our very first issue of our fanzine. Um, yeah, so I guess by the third issue, um, hang on, that's the first issue. By the third issue, this is the third issue, the magazine or the zine was basically just myself. And I'd started to move away from covering the local South, Mu South End music scene. We'd interviewed Crass, who lived about 30 miles up the road near Epping, and that started quite a close friendship with them. I'd begun to be very influenced by their ideas, and those are the Poison Girls, and finding out more about, uh, in air quotes, real anarchism by reading books like Kropotkin's, Phil Factories and Workshops and Mutual Aid, George Woodcock's Anarchism, um, things like Cien Fuegos Press, Anarchist Review, Peter Harper's Radical Technology, reading up on things like the Angry Brigade, the Situationists, learning about the Spanish Civil War, and kind of getting into pub debates with the local socialist worker guys about politics, pacifism, animal liberation, and that kind of thing. And as the zine went on, it used to uh, include much more non-musical content, moving away from covering bands and things. So you'd have articles on politics, anarchism, the campaign for nuclear disarmament and the peace movement, animal rights, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think actually New Crimes was one of the very first fanzines to actually include a, a vegetarian re um, recipes page, which was um, yeah quite innovative at that time. Um, and I had much wider tastes, I think, than a lot of the standard punk fair. I was also interested in a lot of the experimental stuff that was going on at the time. Um, we had the whole, what was called the um, cassette culture stuff that was happening at that time. Um, that would be our way back then. That was how we shared our music and uh, music that you might not be able to hear at that time. It'd be on the radio or on TV. So people would exchange cassette tapes and send them through the post to each other. And that was our way. That was, a, that was the closest thing we kind of had to things like YouTube and Spotify and uh, those mediums that exist today. And so one offshoot of New Crimes fanzine was New Criminals, which was the New Crimes compilation tape, which included a lot of the bands that were featured in the uh, in the zine. This is a way of getting them heard. So we record tracks by them and put them out and sell them through the post. And a lot of it was the we had this. It would be like send someone a blank tape with a stamped address envelope, and you get the tape and you fill it up with the music. And then you send it back to them. And that was a really kind of quite an efficient and democratic way of sharing music at that time. Um, so. Moving on a bit, I guess by 82, 83, maybe 84, anarcho-punk was beginning to um, start to feel quite stale in a, in a bit of a creative and political ghetto. And I was becoming more interested in a lot of the um, dance and rap music and the kind of New York club scene stuff was beginning to be heard in the UK, but still quite underground. Things like um, Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bambata, Planet Rock, um, Arthur Baker, things like The Last Poets and things like that. And I think what was happening 
a lot of that was moving into, um, you know, bands like Joy Division had turned into New Order and New Order were beginning to be produced by people like Arthur Baker. So that was very much beginning to seep into the underground or alternative culture I was a part of. And so I began to sort of feature that kind of music. I think that's one of the, the last issues of New Crime where we're featuring much more of that sort of music and moving away from the punk scene evolving I guess um, so yeah that was probably the last issue of New Crimes I may have done one more after this but anyway this is basically one of the last issues and from that how are we doing for time um, Tim yeah yeah we're, we're good um, you we're you've got a good five five minutes okay we're cool. keeping to time Great. we can roll up longer Graham no, no, I think, I think that sounds good to me. Um, yeah, so we're at, kind of at the end of New Crimes fanzine now, which then moved into, by 1984, things had begun to kind of quite hot up politically in the UK. It was um, post-Falklands -Falk, post War, and Margaret Thatcher was in for a second term, kind of with a vengeance, really, the minor strike was in full swing, and so a lot of our group energy started to be going to kind of focus, focusing on kind of campaigning and protest activities. We formed a local anarchist group to support the minor strike and peace camps at US air bases like Green and Common and Molesworth. And we also started producing the South End Libertarian and Anarchist Broadsheet, okay? the slab so this was kind of a smaller but much more regular publication and was much more the product of a collective and directly political and campaign orientated um, I used to go up to Freedom Bookshop in East London which is just off the Whitechapel Road just right next to the Whitechapel Gallery still there and help out with minor strike support mail outs and here I met Albert Meltzer, who was the founder of the anarchist Black Flag, sorry, Black Flag newspaper. And he told me a lot about the radical history of South End that I hadn't previously been aware of. And he also wrote an article for the slab about Matt Kavanagh, who was an anarchist barber who lived in South End and organised against mostly black shirts around the time before the Second World War. And Years and years later, this was only like maybe two or three years ago, I also discovered that Matt Kavanagh had organised a talk by American anarchist Emma Goldman at South End Labour Hall in 1936. Uh, who knew this sleepy seaside town had once hosted such anarchist royalty? And that was something I only discovered really through doing you know, this paper, The Slab. So it kind of does open up all these... Um, doorways and windows into histories that one might not otherwise be aware of. Um, I had included to produce an eighth edition of New Crimes around this time, and I was working on that at the same time, and had quite a lot of the articles and material assembled, but for one reason or another it, it didn't happen. Um, but one of the things in there was um, Steve, who, Dr Pretorius, our co-founder of the magazine, um, he wrote a really nice piece. Um, by this time, he was now like an out gay man living in London, and it was a guide from his perspective to coming out and how to stay safe and where to go to advice and good clubs and clubs you should go to and things like that. And that's one thing I do particularly regret that never actually got published because that was a really excellent article. Um, but anyway. Um, Censorship. The only issue we ever had with censorship was right at the very beginning with New Crimes when the Evening Echo newspaper, that's South End newspaper, did a story on us and through that we came to the intention of our employer, uh, HM Customs and Excise, the tax office as I said, and Chris and I were called into the, our line manager's office after he'd obviously scoured through a copy very thoroughly looking for something to complain about and found, as I put here, a disparaging reference to the Queen in the lyrics of a song we'd reprinted. 
Uh, we were reminded that as public servants, this was unacceptable and that we'd better not do it again. So we just made sure no future copies of the zine went in, in his direction, whilst at the same time continuing to make full use of the office photocopier to print up copies and covers and things like that. Um, yeah, I'm kind of, kind of wrapping up now. So, fanzines were the main grassroots communication media for the time. They were a way of finding out what was going on, of sharing information, and having a voice that wasn't mediated by experts, journalists, or tastemakers, such as Sounds or the Musical Express. It was also a way of organising politically and disseminating our propaganda, just using what was available to us at the time. Of course, this was all long before the internet, which I think can be quite difficult to envisage nowadays. For someone of my generation, it would be like trying to imagine the world before TV or radio. Aside from that, I found the experience of doing new crimes really empowering. It showed me that I had a voice and gave me a platform to express and develop my own ideas. It demystified the process of publishing and I helped so several other zines along the way, including having the wherewithal to put out the slab bulletin, which was much more urgent and of the moment. And another, pro project, another one I was quite proud of, um, did a zine who lived at a residential home in Westleaf on sea for adults with learning disabilities called um, Shelford. And this is a, a picture on the screen there of the magazine we put together, which was great. It was giving people a voice, people with learning disabilities in South End. They could talk about their experiences, their life, share their artwork, share their writings and stuff like that. So I'm particularly proud of that one. Um, so afterwards, I kind of focus more on putting out single issue pamphlets, I suppose you could call them, um, including Well Fed, Not an Animal Dead, which was a selection of vegan recipes and arguments that I would give out to people rather than constantly having to answer the same questions. I mean, veganism is quite a thing now, it's quite a, um, a mainstream thing, but back then it was still quite marginal. Uh, I became vegan, as Tim said, back in 1984. And there'd be forever people coming up, well, what do you eat? Why are you vegan then? So rather than answering those same questions over and over again, I just produced this little pamphlet and I was like, there you are, take that away and read that and then we don't have to have those discussions and arguments. Um, so there's Well Fed, Not an Animal Dead. There was one called um, Dig for Revolution, which was possibly the world's first punk gardening zine. And I guess I'm still doing zines to this day through self-publishing, and kind of permaculture and putting out books and um, pamphlets and uh, posters and all kinds of self-produced media. So hopefully that gave um, a little bit of my background. There are probably a few references in there that probably sounded like something out of um, an ancient museum or something like that. But hopefully it still gives, you know, hopefully there's enough in there to be share how, how, why did I start a zine and what was that experience like? Uh, is that okay, Tim? That's, that's perfect. Thank, thanks for the overview, Graham. Thanks. I'll stop my share. Cool. Okay. Um, so I've, I've got a few questions and I think some of them you, you, you covered um, in that, that great, great presentation. So your first, your first uh, memories of zines, and uh, um, uh, what were the first zines that you that you made? So, new new crimes, and then bang, and this the slab you 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 mentioned. Yeah, I'd say um, yeah, the first thing, the first actual, as I said, the first punk zine was probably good old sniffing glue, but my first engagement was probably through bang, and mm. yeah, which was. They weren't really punky people at all. They were kind of more kind of poet, poets and artists locally. But there was a lot of crossover. And as I say, I bought the um, duplicator off of them. But that duplicator had a bit of a lineage. There were several other zines that had also used the same duplicator. It had been passed down the line quite a bit. So Yeah, yeah. so a messy, messy duplicating machine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 
um Gestetna, yeah which is yeah 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 and that, <laughs> that that world was the the it was like a cast off from um what was called serious printing yeah wasn't it? so <laughs> it's old, old old technology so yeah um, well, i guess as the technology develops the old technology gets passed down the line yeah, yeah and it's quite interesting because um yeah I, the first time i met um lou williams who we'll maybe talk about in a moment but lou williams who does the um girl in print and the girl zine stuff the first time i met her and she was talking about this oh it must be fantastic to you know work with all these technologies and this authentic technology and i say no <laughs> no it wasn't you know like it was horrible she's gonna no, must be you know that kind of romance around this stuff when actually it was kind of quite you know it's like where people might romantic oh it must be great to have like lived in the 1930s before you had electricity and running water and you had to you know you have to keep yourself clean in a tin bath and uh heat up your hot water on the kettle <laughs> no no <laughs> it might be good to do it for a you know for a couple of hours but you don't want to live like that and that's not how you want to be producing your uh, fanzines if there's other things you know we use that because we had no choice <laughs> yeah and and what what was av available so there, i forget the name of the zine was there was one that, yeah what was um uh, was used lipstick for um the the text because that was something that was available and yeah. um, and so there there were things like so I, I guess in your research you would have come across um how things were produced sort, sort of methods what technologies were used so for example i don't know photocopiers and Electroset mm. transfer and um, stencils and I don't know and I guess the emergence of desktop publishing. Yeah, yeah, I guess that kind of happened. Um, I guess maybe very late eighties, early nineties, and it was definitely quite ubiquitous by the mid nineties. You actually see in, in my book, you got this transition from very messy stuff that just using whatever is available whether it's old old you know at best you know if you were lucky you had access to a photocopier but in the early days even photocopiers were kind of quite hard to come by and so you'll see in the book everything moves from this kind of quite messy um production values so everything as a desktop publishing kind of we move into that era things start to become much tidier and neater and in a way, there's almost a loss of a lot of you know, what characterises what it is to be a zine, I think. It starts mm. to become quite, they start to become quite generic and formulaic, I think, by the mid-90s. Sure, sure. And at the and time, they, it was great. Oh, look at this, great. We can, we, we've got access to desktop publishing. It's wonderful. I think we're now seeing that things are moving back to the kind of the DIY, you know, Rizo is, in, you know, amongst zine makers i think riso is very much riser print risographic print is becoming much more um a favored technology which is which which yeah which i like but yeah yeah well tony tony and i were, were uh, um having a having a chat about um sort of why a5 formats and i think you touched on it in your talk which is um i think i said to Tony, it was because you could produce them at work on when the, the, the when the boss wasn't looking, and so um, <laughs> and that, yeah, that was the, that's what sort of governed the. Um, it wasn't about it being necessarily a handy size. It was just mm. um, you could you could produce um, your your stuff for nothing while your mate was keeping an eye out. <laughs> yeah, well, mine, mine was actually A four. Most of my stuff was A four, but. Um, yeah, A5 was always, because it's kind of pocket size as well. You could just, like, stick it in your pocket as well and carry it around. So, yeah, I think my later publications were more A5 format, but certainly the earlier ones were much A4. But, yeah, that would be very much one of the reasons, yeah, because you're sort of sneaking into the uh, the photocopier when everyone else had gone home or during lunch break or whatever and, or whenever the boss wasn't looking. Yeah, yeah. very much so. So um, I mean, there's been some talk about is is print dead, and uh, or or do you do you feel um, or have you got examples where they kind of um, work with print media and online sort of sim simultaneously? Yeah, um, the uh, the woman I just referred to, Lou Williams, she works very much in both media. Um, 
and it was a question I put to her in the book, you know, why, why are you actually doing this when you could be just communicating this stuff through social media in, you know, the media we, we wouldn't have had back in, back in my day. Um, but, um, yeah, she works very much in both media. And there's just something I think about the physicality of that media. You know, there's just something about the printed page that I guess it's hard to put into words, really, but... Um, I suppose it's just something, producing, you're putting your ideas together and producing something that's like a, a material object in the world. Mm. I guess maybe it's the relationship, you know, why do we, um, why do people still grow their own food? Why do people get allotments or, you know, buy tomato plants and grow tomatoes in their garden when you can just go down the shop and buy tomatoes or, you know, you buy ready-made food. But there's just something about that being physically involved in the process. I think that's probably even a, even a human need to some degree. Mm. To, to touch something. Yeah, the physicality, the materiality yeah. of it, yeah. Can I just add to that, Jeds? We had this conversation this morning with the students, and actually the students were saying um, they are more material orientated. They like the physical. It is sure. about the page, the tactile quality of the page. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and Lou right. finds that, and it's very much, which she does a lot of these um, zine making workshops with uh, young women, she calls it girls in, girls in, G-R-R-R-L, you know, as a, as a throwback or a callback to uh, Riot Girl and that kind of movement back in the um, 90s. And so she runs the workshop usually with young women, young um, teenage women, and it's, um, yeah, it's just a way of expressing, I think, that maybe is different from social media. And she talks about how with things like Instagram, particularly for young women, there can be all this pressure, you know, you've got to have this look, you've got to be like, you know, you've got to look like this, you've got to be uh, conventionally attractive, all those kind of stereotypes that are often maybe associated around some of the images that you might see on Instagram, whereas the... Um, a lot of the workshops she's doing with the um, young women where they're creating their own zines is very much about people defining their own. I suppose it ties in a lot with the stuff around queer politics and uh, a lot of the feminist politics and trans politics and stuff where it's just um, people are able to maybe express, express themselves in a different way. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um what um just sort of not, what what um is for you is the um or sort of generally actually what is the the value in zine zine culture and what and sort of why is zine culture important for for you um well i guess for me um it is it is that voice as i um mentioned in my presentation that um it's a voice that's not mediated by experts or professional journalists or newspapers in my you know in my case it was like the music the, the mainstream music press we could have our own voice and I think just a lot of this stuff was just ephemera when it's produced nobody thought that 50 years later um, there'll be like some online discussion you know this academic discussion of this stuff it was just produced for the moment and a lot so a lot of it was just kind of thrown away or not kept or passed on to someone else but it's actually if you kind of look at the story i've told through the book there is a whole narrative an alternative narrative to the story of south end on sea i think so mm. so it is that yeah it's like us telling our own story i think rather than having a version of South End on Sea, which I think you 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 use the word, or the grotesqueries of South End, or the yeah. grotesqueries of Essex culture. Yeah, well, I guess it's um, so South End and, and Essex is is sort of often portrayed as a sort of grotesque caricature by um, mainstream media. So you've got Towie, Essex boy gangsters um, come come to mind and. Uh, and so, so how how is your this project um, addressing um, placism, which is the um... well, that actually that was actually the, the genesis of the whole thing, really. There are a couple of things, really. Um, 
One was I went to um, a permaculture gathering somewhere up in Yorkshire in some rural place and I was introduced by a mutual friend to somebody, uh, a young woman, and he said, this, this is my friend Graham, he comes from South End on Sea in Essex, and this woman just burst out laughing. And I said, um, what's kind of, you know, sorry, what, what's the joke? And she said, oh no, sorry, I didn't mean to be rude, but South End on Sea, hardly the sort of place you'd associate with permaculture and things like that. And that kind of like, it sparked off something about, yeah, well, that you know, you've only need, like, the grotesque character, you know, there's a, it's actually this incredibly rich and diverse place where there's this whole culture going on. So that was number one. And then, round about the same time, I went to a talk by um, Tim Burrows, I guess you're probably familiar with, or hopefully your students yeah. are familiar with. Um, maybe maybe not. So um, Tim, Tim Burrows uh, is a journalist, um, works for The Guardian, I think, or did um who's who's um so documents essex in um alternative ways to the to the, to the norm to the normal tropes that we tim is that um tim burrows with b-u-double-r-o-w-s that's that's right yeah yeah got it um, so i went to his presentation which was run by um club critical theory and it was a talk about seaside cultures and those stereotypes are around you know that we just talked about and at the q and a afterwards i was saying well you know there is this whole other history this whole other narrative we've got artists we've got these amazing bands some of them are well known some are less known um we've had a folk scene we've got jazz we you know south end um has got a strong avant-garde jazz and music scene and and he was saying, yeah, great, but where are these stories told? You know, where are they? Where is this documented? And then I was going, well, it'll be in, you know, these these publications, you know, like um, fanzines and underground magazines and stuff that people just produced. And he said, well, where where can you get hold of these then? And that was the thing that goes, <laughs> he said, well, it needs to be documented, doesn't it? It was like a discussion, you know, like. And I think it was thrown back at me, well, who's going to do that then? And I said, well, suppose I am then. And that was the <laughs> incentive to do it, really, because I thought, you know, having that interest in it already, nobody else has done it. And it's taken quite a while to actually pull all this together and track all these people. And many of them are long gone now, obviously. And uh, some people you can't trace. And I'm sure there's a lot more things I haven't been able to get hold of. And always get the feeling I'm only scratching the surface with what I've done and that there's going to be a lot more that's hopefully going to come to light. So. Yeah, yeah. So it reminds me of a, a, a friend, academic, Dr. <coughs> Jess, Jess Baines, who, who researched about um, radical and alternative print shops of the 70s and 80s. And that, that sort of grew out of um, a half-joking remarks, uh, um, someone should do the history before we all die. And it's sort of, there's this sort of lost lost histories that um, and people's histories, and uh, I sort of see see your project as um, an example of um, a people's history project that in, enables the the sort of disenfranchised, the oppressed, the poor, the the nonconformist and otherwise marginal groups to find find voice again, and mm. and rather so. So for, for our students, if you've not heard of people's histories or sometimes called histories from below, um, they're kind of like historical narratives from the perspective of common people rather than leaders or royalty or nobility and aristocracy. So and often these, these stories don't um, uh, make their way into the history, history books. So, um, so I kind of, I, I see this this is one of those um, those great those great projects, Graham. Yeah, and that that actually was very much an incentive to get on with this because one of the people who was very much a, a player in the South End punk scene, and he did a fanzine back in the day. Very good friend of mine, um, Julian Wehrlein, who um, uh, later became a Labour councillor. He was the um, um, yeah, he will. You know, he he he, he was leader of the Labour Council, the Labour leader of the Councillor, very good friend of mine, 
and we'd offer we'd go for a drink and we'd say sort of, this project's yours it's great you know we must do that we must sit down and have an, um, an interview and start getting this done and he did he passed away a couple of years ago and that was very much well i never did do that interview with julian and i can either sit here talking about this to people in pubs and what great idea it is or get on with it really because who's going to be next or i might be next you know so that definitely did you know this story needs there's an urgency to this because we are all getting older we're a generation we're starting to kind of pass away or people are starting to kind of lose their memories and stuff like that so yeah so i think there is an urgency to capture it while it's still there and i, I guess it's so it's like zines are ephemeral so so are so are we yeah uh, precisely yeah. So there's that sort of connection between that uh, materiality of voice and the people the people behind it mm, uh, very much so guys can i interject because i'm just really aware of time we've got 10 yeah. minutes left um sure. do you mind if we open it to the to the students absolutely yeah sure thing. um guys can i just lead by asking um graham mm -hmm. that it's kind of our project related um how do you come up with the zine titles? Uh, they just spring into your head, really. Um, there is actually kind of my own one, New Crimes. That was actually a reference to um, there was this. This is going back to the night at that time we were putting it together. Uh, my friend and I came out of a pub. We were we were very drunk, and I can't remember exactly what happened. But anyway, we managed to get arrested, and we got charged under something and it was something we'd never heard of and i said that's a new crime and my mate said why don't you call me fans in that then and that so that's the story i'm not particularly proud of that story because you know my misspent youth but um so that, that was that one but i think you know they just come from random places really i think okay and also with that in mind Graham, when you've got the z title does that infect the content or not at all in my case i would say not at all i don't okay. think it was really uh yeah I don't think it was really a... Okay. Uh, my last question before I hand over to the students. Um, so when you published the zines, Graham, did you publish... Um, were they were they published rap, um, sporadically or did, were they a monthly thing? How strict were you with publishing? Um, it was very sporadic. I think the first couple... I mean, a, a common pattern would be you you do the first one and then about a month later you do the second one and, a month, and then it kind of would be three months or four months and then... So it kind of petered off, and I guess in the end, quite people quite quite often people evolved to do something else. You know, they became more competent, and in some cases, became you know proper journalists. Air quotes, um, but yeah, or else they ran out of things to say. Really, <laughs> so um, yeah. No, that's interesting in itself because it, then, otherwise, then you're sort of also you're working to a, a much more orthodox way. If you said it's mm. every month. And the whole point is it, it's, it's an unorthodox voice. So I guess mm. the way that it came out would be unorthodox. Mm. Right? Um, when, when we're moving to the night, you know, when I said, you know, it became more about kind of desktop publishing, it's interesting a lot of those ones were kind of on a monthly schedule, but they basically became like listings magazine, you know, what gigs were going to be in what pubs and things like that. And there didn't seem to be as much kind of editorial comment, or if there was, it would just be about you know an interview with some band or something like that rather than the the political or the commentary or that kind of stuff so yeah sure okay guys i'm going to shut up um students any questions for your side raise your hand so celine has a question yeah yeah tony can we can you point us in the yeah thank you Hello, I can see her hand. Yeah. <laughs> Waving. <laughs> yeah. Did you hear that, Graham? So in terms of what, what Celine's saying, in terms of say the variety of content that would be in there, mm -hmm. would you think that, you know, because we've got to obviously assess the student work, right? So they've got to do, you know, a review, an interview, a photo shoot, a collaboration. Would you be that kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, Celine, would you be that kind of regimented in terms of what you put into the zine? Or was it more random? Um, it would be very random, yeah, because obviously your, your guys, 
young men and women uh, kind of you've got you you've got a format to follow whereas we were just kind of like stick what you like in really because you know we weren't kind of answerable to anybody else and it wouldn't be assessed or marked or go through an editorial process or anything like that. so it'd be basically yeah i mean it'll be there would be a level of being on topic you know I, as i said i moved from kind of covering initially it was like local punk bands and things like that or local post-punk bands with the odd article in there and then it kind of moved to more as my interests moved, you know, more kind of political content, articles about anarchism, animal rights, animal liberation. I put a lot of articles in about how to, how other people could make their own zines. That was a big thing at the time. It was like, um, there was a man called the Desperate Bicycles who were around about the same time and they were very much DIY, you know, this whole notion of DIY, do it yourself. And their whole thing was, it was easy, it was cheap, go and do it. So we'd be encouraging other people to just do their own stuff as well. So yeah, it was just put in whatever you like, really. So the, yeah, it would be a mixture of um, interviews, editorial, photographs, collages. Um, I think, you know, I think there was a particularly famous page in, in Sniffing Glue magazine, which is one of the earliest ones, and all it across the page in a marker pen the editor had just written I can't think what to write on this page and that was the page so it was anything <laughs> anything and everything really thank you so, so Tony how would you how would you mark that well, they could, <laughs> I don't mind them doing that at all they, they, could, they could do it in, as an extra but yeah. I've got, they <laughs> if they want to spin out away from that they can absolutely do that they could do that I would I'd, I'd love it but they've got to do what you know. It's been set. Otherwise, otherwise, I need things I to compare to. <laughs> I'm teasing. teasing. <laughs> and, and another thing, we didn't have word processors or anything like that. So, what you typed was, and when you typed onto these stencil sheets, you couldn't basically change it. So, and I never used to kind of write anything in advance. You know, I never used to do like a maybe there was a few rough notes but it'd almost be like a stream of consciousness coming out onto the page and any spelling mistakes or errors would just be kind of like that was it you couldn't go back and correct it it's like oh i could have phrased that better or i've made a mistake there i can correct that it's like once it was on there so quite expensive these sheets you know they're about 10p a page which was a lot of money in those days you know <laughs> so um so what you know what you typed was what you you ended up with sort of thing so yeah, but then I guess surely that the, the mistakes and the errors were the charm of it as well. Oh, absolutely, you know? yeah, yeah, that was all part of it. And then frequently bits, you know, we just like X's. You crossed out bits just by typing an X over the you know, X's over the bits you got wrong. And, so. mm. and that's really interesting because I think for the students, I mean, you know, leaving the mistakes in is, I think, for for my students' generation, it's anathema. You know, everything you want everything to be perfect or polished. So zines, in a way, are kind of really pushing, like, ugh, rough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seeing if I've got one to hand, actually. Um, guys, ah, here we are. Bear with me. I actually have a copy to hand of New Crimes 1, and just see if I can see any examples of the uh, the appalling you know, production values of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, this would be as, about as good as it got in terms of graphics, where I'd just kind of draw a stencil, you know, draw an image onto there and then just type over the top. So this is a review of um, a play called Sus, put together by 784. So that was, oh, there's the back page of Stop Press, all the last minute bits of news where, I don't know, was it? Things you should buy, we didn't have time to review. The new full live album, Passions album, New Crash, Boys and Girls, Single, and, and other fanzines we recommend. Oh, other fanzines, FAC, it's free and good. I mean, that was, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But also, Graham, it sounds like everything zine-wise was very related to, it had a soundtrack, didn't it? You know, the mm. band that you were into. So, yeah. was, again, was the written content influenced by, you know, a soundtrack to your life at that time? Absolutely. I mean, that would be a regular thing, and it'd be like your top ten, and it'd be the records you happen to be listening to. You're not based on sales or anything like that. Your top ten records are your, the records you like the most at the moment. So, yeah. 
so, I, so I guess the um, so uh, one of, one of my sort of questions uh, uh, the was uh, were there any fashion just fashion zines at that time or were they a whole kind of subculture around a particular style so music clothes etc there were I mean none that I mean my yeah, it was it was kind of punk but I was never part of the punk I never dressed in a particularly punky fashion and neither did most of my peer group I think you know there are kind of some myths around that that because you liked the clash and the sex pistols and crass you had this look but we were kind of all quite as you at those photos of what we looked like back then we were quite sort of geeky really you know um but there were you know there were definitely mod scenes around that was quite a thing you know the mod revival stuff of the late 70s early 80s um i think maybe moving more into the mid 80s early 90s you would get more the kind of fashion um when you say fashion, do you mean kind of like you things like um, mod or punk or yeah, goth, well, um, goth or whatever? Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, I think they were. Yeah, yeah. I don't think any from South End were particularly um, fashion orientated. I think it was more. Yeah, it, it kind of got more indie. You know, this kind of generic, rather meaningless term indie that kind of grew from post punk. You know, maybe there was a kind of movement around that. But so, guys, we've got. Can we just close on any other student questions? Because I've kind of got. Oh gosh, it's three o'clock already. Um, guys, any other questions? <laughs> I don't think we do, guys. I don't want okay. their, they want their break. I don't think we do. <laughs> no, no, we've got more. We've got two more hours yet. All right. Um, no, 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 not at all. Great. Um, I just <laughs> say okay. thank you so much um, for that. Um, I guess my question would be, Graham, is it all right? You know, the, the presentation you just showed us. Yeah. Could I share that with the students? Could I? Sure. Yeah. yeah. And I can send kind of the script through as well. So it kind of makes a bit of sense. Make, so. Please. That'd be fantastic. Tim, is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll, I'll share it on the, yes. um, the, web page that i put together which yeah. this recording will um sit there as well of oh, today's chat um so oh, there'll be and is that accessible to the general public or is it just an internal right okay um and how how would it be if i did share this or, or would you prefer not what do you mean like if i stuck it you know a link because I've got recording as well, but I... oh. yeah, I mean, as a promo thing for the book and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there's no. Can we can we put it on the London South Bank platform, Tim, in terms of the book? So, so yeah, I mean, no, no problem with it being publicly available. So that page that I've set up is is publicly available. It's not behind any um password protected area so yeah yeah links to that would be would be that'd fine be a, that'd probably be the easiest yeah. thing wouldn't it okay cool uh, let, if there is you know just let me know and we'll take it from there lovely and one one other last last thing um uh when will the publication be available um well i was hoping it'd be kind of out by now it was originally going to come out in early 2020 but for obvious reasons it all fell by the wayside um originally it was going to be like an art we were looking to get arts council funding but that obviously another thing that fell apart with the covid and stuff like that so currently looking at launching a crowdfunder soon to raise the costs of printing and associated costs so hopefully early next year i'll, I'll say i was hoping it'd be out by christmas but i think realistically we're looking at early next year shall we say spring 2022 Right. So, and if it's earlier than that, that's great. But, uh. <laughs> keep, keep us, keep us definitely posted, and I'll, I'll ensure that our um, library purchases some copies. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Graham. Thank you great. so much. No problem. I'll uh, see you all soon. Yeah. Well, so, thank you. Thank you very much, Graham. <laughs> and see everyone. Yes, we're happy. And uh, good, you know, good luck with your course, folks. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Cheers. Take care. Yeah.
Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.